Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you all here today. I'm uh, glad you are with us for some biblical, theological, and worldview questions on this Friday. Good morning, Americans. It's Friday, and I look forward to being with you for biblical, theological, and worldview questions. And, um, you know, on Friday, we do some psycho babble with Dr. White. And uh, I will uh, look forward to uh, hearing your psycho babble inquiries down, you know, later towards the end of the hour. The way you get that in is you just put a question. If you'd put the word question first, that'll help if you're watching live. Say question and then say, I have a friend who, I have a friend who. That's, that's the key to get into psychobabble. You can also do that at askthetheologian.com. You can leave it anonymous. Even if you don't leave it anonymous, I'm going to make it anonymous for psychobabble with Dr. White. That is uh, what we will be working on here in just a moment. Uh, but you know what I, what I should bring about? Breaking news. Da, 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 da. Ladies and gentlemen at Dispensational Publishing House, we now have Right Division Issues and Answers, my latest book right there. <laughs> Uh, there it is. Learn how right division arose from dispensationalism, yet offers distinct insights into correctly handling biblical texts. Discover the liberating truth of our identity in Christ and freedom from the law. See how this perspective helps resolve theological dilemmas that have troubled believers for centuries. The charismatic dilemma, the prophetic dilemma, the legalism dilemma. Comparison of dispensational views. You, even, you can slide down there. You've got the uh, chapters, the uh, seven chapters of the book and a couple appendices that are uh, given in there. The, uh, the, the intro to right division and then those various dilemmas we talked about. I think, by the way, I, th I thought as I was researching, you know, this like history of the charismatic movement here uh, it is, uh, it's an interesting thing. There's some other things that have some history in it, some forms of legalism, historical background to legalism. Many of us came out of uh, somewhat legalistic backgrounds, uh, comparing progressive, traditional, mid-Acts, Acts 28 dispensationalism, navigating the dispensational divide, looking at the attacks on dispensationalism. All that, ladies and gentlemen, at dispensationalpublishing.com. If you just happen to go to the home page, if you're right, uh, right now, you go to the homepage, it'll be right there, first one. That may change depending on when you are watching the program, but uh, nonetheless, there it is. $14.95. We appreciate your purchase. Christmas is coming. Who's the theologian in your family? Who's the one that uh, you, you want to say, huh, they think they know everything, but they need to read this. You, you just order a copy and it'll be all good and ready to go. And uh, look forward to that. Sending those out to you. <laughs> John, thank you. He said book and I started to drool. <laughs> he says, I think I have a book addiction. I love people with book addictions. Book addictions, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to have a a book edition, book addiction. I'll get that. Um, so, um, yeah, I got a couple. I have a friends coming in. You just send those on in. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. Where are we going to pick up? Oh, Kelly's question. I'll just delete the question because it's answered now. Kelly yesterday asked, when can I get your new right division book? Hashtag waiting with bated breath. Well, no more waiting other than shipping. And uh, I think, Madison, we got, we got copies on the shelf, right? Yeah. yeah, we got copies on the shelf. You order it today. It goes out today. You'll probably have it by noon someday. Uh, <laughs> you just uh, go for it. Okay, let's, uh, let's pick up with our... Um, our questions here. Uh, our friend Austin up in Colorado Springs, question from yesterday. What do you think of the recovery version with notes? Witness Lee, Watchman Nee, Study Bible. I know they're Acts 2. 
but what do you think of the quality of their notes? Now I am going to have to speak a little bit, um, in the dark. And the reason is because I do not have a recovery version, but I have the internet. Let's see. Let's see if we can piece together a few things. Here we go. Uh, the Holy Bible recovery version. I would like to know, uh, we'll be able to do this. Um, what, what is their, their principal hermeneutic, uh, translation. Let's, let's see if they have anything here. Okay. Here we go on the need for Bible translation. Uh, with many translations of the New Testament already available, is there a need for yet another? There is a need for the New Testament recovery version, they say, because there is a progressive recovery of truth among God's children. That sounds awfully suspicious to me, but it could go either way. Let's, let's just suppose, <laughs> I would be pleasantly surprised to find out this to be the case. I doubt it. Let's just suppose by progressive recovery of truth that they're saying, oh, we recognize that all these, oh, I should say all these, that, that the scant few documents upon which modern versions have been built are bogus and bunk. And so we are recovering, going back to the Textus Receptus. Maybe that's what they mean. I doubt it, but let's see. The truth has been revealed gradually through the ages, and in each age, the level of revelation has affected the understanding of the Bible as well as the translation of the Bible. There, I am just going to say, unless they really change this and, and tell me that they're not saying what I think they're saying, then I would wholeheartedly reject the premise upon which the recovery version is given. So let's take that sentence again. The truth has been revealed gradually through the ages. That seems to say ongoing revelation. I believe that the revelation of scripture is closed and that the, 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 therefore the inspiration, the breathing of scripture is closed and that a person the day after, immediately the day after the close of the 66 books of the New Testament, of the Bible, excuse me, they could read and understand the Bible just as well as we can today. There has been no continuing revelation whatsoever, which makes this a very problematic statement. This, this statement I've got in blue, the truth has been revealed gradually throughout the ages, and in each age, the level of revelation has affected the understanding of the Bible as well as the translation of the Bible, says the Bible is, is, is uh, continuing to change. And we are continuing to get revelation. Absolutely, I fully reject that idea. Let's go on. Every translation necessarily bears the understanding of its translators. Well, yeah. In bringing the ancient text into a modern language, the translators must first understand the original in terms of the original and, in many cases, interpret the original. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take it. Every translation then is the record of the translation's understanding of the original text. Yeah, there's some truth there. After 70 years of Bible study, we too have an understanding of the ancient text. Now, I don't, I don't know what they're, I don't know who the we is and what the 70 years, what, what's that a reference to? After 70 years of Bible study, we too. I don't think they've been working on this for 70 years. And it's, if so, it's, it's different people. I mean, just, just by, so are they saying there's two of us and we both studied for 35 years, or are they saying there's seven of us and we both studied for 10 years, or are they, you know, what, what what's, I, I don't know what that, that means right there. In many places, our understanding depends upon and corresponds to what has been handed down to us through the ages. That's why we question the assumptions. But we must admit that we have seen things that not all see today. I, 
I wish I knew who the what what the, this is this is uh, cycle babble from the from the recovery version. I don't I don't know what they're saying there, but it seems suspicious. Our understanding of the truth then compels us to render the text according to what the Lord has shown us. Is this like who's the Jesus calling woman? Is this is this what's going on there, Sarah Sarah Young? what the Lord has shown us. Look, the Bible is the Bible. You might mistranslate the Bible. Fortunately, we can go back to the original and check it. But there is no need. I'll say this as blunt as I can. There is no need whatsoever for the Lord God to show you anything in order to translate the Bible. You do not need the slightest bit of revelation from God. You need good linguistic capability, period. So all of this goop about our understanding then compels us to render the text according to what the Lord has shown us. That for me, I would say I would not buy that Bible. I wouldn't even call it a Bible. This is somebody's dreams and visions that they're writing in and be giving their interpretation and blaming it on God. They're perverting the word of God. That's, that's, that's what I get so far. Will they prove me wrong? Every major Bible translation understands this principle. That, that's not, that's not, that's not even true. That's a falsity. A good Bible translation is linguistics. Honestly, it will come to the day don't be shocked by this. Celebrate this. It will come to the day when a computer will do a better job translating than a committee of translators because the computer is going to be able to work with no emotion. They don't have any revelations. If, if that computer is given good information, computers are always the same garbage in, garbage out. If the computer is given the good information, it will make the translation perfectly. That, that day is coming. We're not there yet, but that day is coming. And that honestly is probably going to be a good thing for the word of God because we're going to get all these, it's Friday, so I'll just say it. We're going to get all these stupid people out of here, not, you know, who are wanting to, to uh, put in their, their deepest, darkest feelings and what God has revealed to them and get, get all that out of there. I want the word of God that was God breathed. I don't want you to have some vision and that vision influences how you're going to translate that. Let's go on to the translation method. The recovery version conforms to a particular philosophy of Bible translation, I can tell, which admittedly is not in vogue today. Shouldn't ever be in vogue from what I read so far. Every translation of the Bible embodies a philosophy of what the Bible is, about the relation of the writers to God, even about God himself. The trend today is away from a more literal rendering of the ancient text to a more literary one. I would agree, but that looks like what you said in the previous. Am I reading you wrong? Newer translations seek to make the Bible easy to read and understand. While we do not aim for obscurity, we contend that the deep things of God are not simple for human language. See, this is, there's a lot of psychobabble still coming in there. The deep things of God are not simple for human language. I just want the human language when I read the Bible. It's for me to determine the deep things from the words themselves. I've got to have the exact words. You put that over there, get it in English for me, and go with it. It looks to me like they're going to tell me what these deep things of God are. That the mind of Christ is not shallow or easily explained. Don't explain it. Give me the revelation. It is not your job as the translator to make sure I can understand the deep things of God in the mind of Christ. I just need to know what did God say, period. And the content of the Bible comes not merely through our renderings. Oh, excuse me. Austin, why are you making me sick on a Friday morning? <laughs> Sharing this kind of stuff here. Let's see if I can get that a little bigger. 
The content of the Bible comes not merely through our renderings, but by the Spirit, through spiritual words. Forget it. It's garbage. Vomit on it. That kind of made a poem, didn't it? We have the Word of God. Words, all we need. Give us the words. We don't need our the, the Spirit through spiritual words, working a kumbaya experience to tell us what the Word of God means for today. The Word of God means for you. The Word of God means what it says and says what it means, period. Very seldom even needs interpretation. There it is, plain as day. Take it. Our view about Bible translation reflects Paul's words to the Corinthians concerning the ministry in general, which things also we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things with spiritual words. Well, Paul didn't mean what they're saying there. Our words, our translation must be with spiritual words. There's, there, no, because I don't trust you, nor, nor do I trust anybody. I don't want your spiritual words. I want words. Why should I trust you? Well, you have 70 years of study. Not worth a warm bucket of spit, your 70 years of study. I want linguistics. I do not trust you. I never will trust you, regardless of what your academic credentials are, regardless of how long you have walked with God in the woods and felt his moving warmth in your heart. I don't care. I want to know exactly that is the rendering of the ancient words into the modern language, period. So I think this is garbage. Our words, our translation must be with spiritual words, else the spirit, we maintain, has no way, uh, no way nor any responsibility to bear the spiritual things of the Bible. To, I, listen, the spirit can do it through words. He doesn't need you. We admit our translation of this sort is sometimes not the easiest to read or comprehend, mainly because we make up stupid things that make no logic, but we are compelled to sacrifice easy reading for deeper truth. Forget it. Don't do that. Just give the words. Uh, the recovery version embodies a multitude of decisions on the original form of the Greek text. Every major translation of the New Testament follows for the most part the accepted edition of the Greek text of the day. No translation is expected to accept every decision of the Greek edition. Uh, edition, excuse me, translators must grapple, blah, 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 blah. Okay. While the recovery version follows the Nestle Alain 26th edition, why? Why not the 27th edition or the 28th edition? Why not the 1 through 25 edition? Why not the uh, edition du jour? You know, the edition of the day. Why'd you pick the 26th? Well, that's the one that was on our shelf. This is, this is bad. Um, let's see, they've got study aids, I'm sure they're bad, uh, historical valas or whatever all that is, uh, yeah, I don't think I want to read the rest of that. Uh, let's, let, let's, let's try to read something online. Let's go to Ephesians, the third chapter. Oops, that's Ephesians, the first chapter. Here's Ephesians chapter 2, and here is Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on uh, behalf of you, the Gentiles. Let's check the King James. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Um, now i now I got to find where I was here. That's a, the problem of having too many windows open. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship 
of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, that by revelation the mystery was made known to me, as I've written previously in brief, by which, in reading it, you can perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it now been revealed to his holy uh, apostles and prophets in the Spirit, that in Christ Jesus the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise of the gospel, of which I, being a minister, according to the gospel of grace, uh, was given me according to his power, to me less than the least. I, I mean, it looks... It looks sort of like... The, I, I don't understand where they're... Uh, that, that, it, it almost reads like the King James... Let, let's let's try one that we all know. Let's let's go to uh, Psalm twenty three. So they've determined that you pronounce those four Hebrew letters as Jehovah is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside. Waters of rest. Actually, it just says still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of my adversaries. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of Jehovah for the length of my days. It looks to me like these people are utterly confused. Maybe I'm the one confused. They can try to set me straight. They basically, from the translations I have read, they have, they have taken a few interpretive decisions like we want Jehovah instead of Yahweh, instead of the Lord. They have taken the supposedly archaic Middle English, thy, the, the suffixes est and eth. He restoreth my soul. They've made that modern. He restores my soul. Which I actually, I, I, I think that does two things to remove that. One, it removes the poetic nature. They've tried to keep the poetic nature by putting these little lines in here to show you this is the new line of the poem. So why do you want to show that it's poetry and yet have it not sound poetic? I am convinced that poetic is easier to read, understand, uh, remember. So you're creating a version that nobody is ever going to recite. And there, you could find it there where you need those prefixes and suffixes in order to clarify what the actual original ling language had. By taking that out, you're either going to have to make a very long sentence uh, to, to describe what one word says, which you probably haven't done, or you're, you're going you're gonna to lose some specificity there. They, they tr I, I don't know. I mean, from the look of the translation, I would say they tried to make an updated King James that's based upon a bogus text, the Nestle Elan 26th edition. Because the word of God's changing every day. I don't, I don't like it. Now, is that the witness Lee or the watchman knee? If, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, pardon me if I'm wrong on this, witness knee, watchman knee, which witness Lee, watchman knee, I think are, uh, charismatics. And, and their, their thing about translation sounded like charismatic stuff. Um, the notes in there, that's, we ne we've never got to, uh, the, uh, quality of the notes. Let's, let's see if we can find something. My, um, 
footnotes. Here we go. The recovery version contains over 15,000 extensive footnotes stressing the revelation of the truth, the spiritual light, the supply of life. This sound, it sounds like you're reading the, the message. I mean, that. The, their, their translation doesn't sound so much like it, but their, their gobbledygook does. Okay, here's, here's an example. God said, let us make man in our image. Let us reveals that a council was held among the three of the Godhead regarding the creation of man. The decision to create man had been made by the triune God in eternity past, indicating the creation of man was for eternal purpose of the triune God. God's intention in creating man was to carry out his divine economy for the dispensing of himself unto man. This is fully unveiled in the following books of the Bible. Actually, this is fully unveiled in Calvinist theology books. That, that's, a, that's a Calvinist idea, this council of God and the decrees that he's going to make. Oh, here's one on kingdom. Let's see. You shall be a kingdom of priests. As God's people remain in his presence, they become a kingdom of priests. Ah, skip it. The notes aren't worth it. The translation principles behind it aren't worth it. Skip the recovery Bible. That's, that's my word. It's, it's, uh, it is charismatic, Calvinist, feel-good, evangelical, yuck. There's my final word on the Holy Bible recovery version. I, I wasn't aware of this version. I don't, I don't know if anybody actually buys it or not. But, hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, maybe I'm, I, I want to check on something because uh, uh, John says Les Feldick mentions knee in a good light. Let me make sure I got that w- right. Uh, Watchman knee. Uh, okay, the new, neutrality of this article is disputed. At least we know that. Uh, Chinese leader worked... Da, 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 da. Uh, influenced by the Plymouth Brethren, which can be a good thing. Initiated church members. Okay, he uh, did the knee of family and childhood. Let's see what we got here. Conversion and training. A student at Trinity College. Um. <laughs> he was dismissed due to his bad and lazy habits, such as sleeping in late. <laughs> there ought to be a footnote for that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so so he can have some good things here with the Plymouth Brethren connection. Uh, Need derived many of his ideas, including plural eldership, disavowal of clergy laity distinction, worship centered around the Lord's Supper from the Plymouth Brethren. It was part of the exclusive brethren, which uh, is, is closed communion. Recognized the local church movement as a parallel work of God, albeit one that developed independently. He refused to follow their practice of isolating themselves from other Christians and rejecting their ban on celebrating the Lord's. Okay, so, so he came out of the, close, the, the, the exclusive brethren, but he was not one. Uh, matters came to a head when the exclusive brethren learned that during 33, he had broken bread with Honor Oak Christian Fellowship. Well, okay, I, I was putting him as a charismatic, and he does not appear to be a charismatic in this article. So, uh, again, I tried to give that little disclaimer up front that I'm a little bit in the dark on this. Uh, but uh, believed in verbal inspiration of the Bible. The Bible is God's Word. Again, that might be what? what he believed, but if the, if the recovery version, whoever wrote that thing about the translation did, either doesn't believe that or doesn't understand that. 
God's distinctly three, yet fully one. Okay, a Trinitarian belief. He believed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, yeah, we could, uh, let's, let's, let's get, uh, jump down here a little bit. Uh, ascended on third day crowned. Uh, he will return the second time to receive his followers, to save Israel, to establish his millennial kingdom. Okay, a premillennial view. He believed that every person who believes in Jesus Christ will be forgiven of God, washed by his redeeming blood, justified by faith, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, saved by grace, basically a, a free grace view. Such a believer is a child of God, a member of Christ. He believed that the destiny of every believer is to be an integral part of the church, which is the body of Christ and the house of God. Uh, he had a unique blend of brethren theology, the exchange life theology of the Keswick Conventions, and his own East Asians insights into Christian theology. That's, that right there is where I would want to look into. Uh, so brethren theology and Keswick theology. Keswick is charismatic. Brethren is not. Brethren is dispensational. Keswick is charismatic. And East Asian insights, that tends to be mystical. His well-known book, Sit, Walk, Stand, focused on the believer's position in Christ, often associated with free grace theology. It looks like that. So, Nee held that the outer darkness mentioned in Matthew is a temporal place for saved Christians who do not live in obedience. I wouldn't go there. Uh, interesting stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll have to uh, check that out sometime. His big book, The Normal Christian Life. I, su I suppose we should uh, look into that if we wanted to know. Okay. That was a long time on that one. Here we go. Dan in Montrose, Colorado, Ben Shapiro, the Jewish pundit and publisher of the conservative news outlet, The Daily Wire, posted this today on his Facebook page. I'm taking Dan's word that this is what he posted. Quote, one of the best expositors for the existence of God is William Lane Craig, a brilliant apologist. He has a great book called The... I assume you pronounce it Kalam, K-A-L-A-M, cosmological argument, based on ancient Islamic sources, end quote. The question then, is Ben Shapiro, even though not a believer in the grace gospel, correct on this account? I know nothing of William Craig Lane, but I'm suspicious of so-called apologista because, for one thing, I don't know any apologists, including the late Dave uh, Hunt of Berean Call, who read the Bible with a dispensational eye, must much less rightly divide. Uh, yeah, you know William Lane Craig. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do another one of these. William Lane Craig is one of these that uh, is well known as an apologist, um, but he's a Wheaton guy, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, Wheaton forever has been so standard evangelical. Uh, but is he, is he a good philosopher, thinker? Let's uh, check here. Christian apologist, author, Wesleyan theologian. Okay. Uh, that, that would be a non-Calvinist, but, but also not not free grace. Wesleyanism, you, you earn your sanctification. You work towards sanctification. Uh, upholds a Molinism, that's a, a, a mild non-Calvinism view, Neo-Apollinarianism. Professor of philosophy at Houston Christian University. That used to be Houston Baptist University. Uh, they changed uh, to uh, be less Baptist and more Christian or something like that. I don't know. Uh, mildly, well, it's evangelical conservatives, Houston, Houston Baptist. Uh, research professor at Biola University. Again, that same thing. It's a, a former fundamental perspective at Biola, Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and now uh, standard conservative evangelicalism. 
has updated and defended the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. He also published works where he argues in favor of historic plausibility of the resurrection. You know, my, my guess is going to be that if you are Ben Shapiro, who believes in God, he's a Jew, uh, my guess is going to be if you want to have a philosophical discussion, then the Kalam cosmological argument is probably going to be as good as any that there is to sort of prove the existence of God. I, I think uh, this, this, this may come as a surprise or a shock to hear because Christianity, evangelicalism sort of loves apologetics and they love to prove the existence of God. I sort of think to spend a lot of time proving the existence of God is one, trying to prove the obvious, but what you've got even more than that is you are, you are spending a lot of time, a lot of resources, and I mean mental resources and time resources, for a very slim portion of society. It would be kind of like if I decided I was going to sell widgets, I would not say I want to sell atheist widgets. You know, widgets with an atheist sticker on them. Why would I do that? There's so few of them that I'd never make any money. So my point on all of these philosophical arguments for God, I suppose there's room for them. But in the end, I would come over to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God. Let's separate humanity right there. Do you accept that or do you reject that? If you accept it, you come over here with, I would say, probably 99% of humanity. Now, they're going to have different views of God and all this kind of stuff, but let's just start there. In, so, so I would take more of the prove God exists. I would take the filter approach. And if, a, a big funnel, a manifold funnel, that would, that's what it would be. And uh, you, you pour everybody into that funnel and out come those who do not believe in God. They can get on this bus and everybody else is going to come, those who do believe in God. And then you're going to go from there. In the beginning, God. Okay, we believe in God. Created the heavens and the earth. How many believe that God is the creator? Let's again, let's do this separation. Let's have, I don't know what you call that, you know, some sort of a flow chart that puts every everybody out. And William Lane Craig then, it looks like, or the cosmological argument, and those who spend the time in this, and this is a lot of apologetics, they're spending all their time and resources for this little sliver of people. There are people in my community who don't believe in God, but even at that, in, in Taos, New Mexico, it is a tiny, tiny sliver of people who do not believe in God. For the most part, they all believe in God. Some, some sort, some nature, not that God is revealed in the Bible necessarily, but they believe in God and the spiritual existence out there. So spending all this time to try to prove the existence of God to me is just uh, uh, a, a little bit, it, it's, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm sure I've done this before, <laughs> but I go to conferences sometime and I sit and listen to them and I'm like, would you, would you get on because we already know all this? You, you all probably say this like now. Would you get on? Because we already know all this. Get to get to the stuff that matters. So I hate to say to William Lane Craig, but probably there's better ways to spend your time. But Ben Shapiro obviously likes the book. Ben Shapiro obviously believes in God. Ben Shapiro is not a believer in the grace gospel, absolutely. Is he correct that one of the best expositors for the existence of God is William Lane Craig? I'll just go with, because I haven't read William Lane Craig's stuff, and I probably won't, but I'll say, okay, yeah, he's probably correct. Ben Shapiro is probably correct. But once again... Who reads the Kalam cosmological argument? People like Ben Shapiro who already believe in God. 
seminarians who already believe in God. That's, that's who reads that. Atheists don't read the book because it's as simple as I believe in God, I don't believe in God. I, very, very few atheists are not believing in God because they didn't have a good enough cosmological argument, philosophical argument. They got other reasons for not believing in God. So, but anyway, given, given the state of the question, I'd say, yeah, it's, it, it, probably if you need a book on cosmological arguments for the existence of God, William Lane Craig would probably be your your way to go. Um, but I think if, if you are a young man, we have some young men listening to us. If you're a young man thinking, oh, I should get me a theological education and you say, oh, I love apologetics. Forget it. Don't do apologetics. No, no young man should go into apologetics. Don't get a degree in apologetics. That's what a waste of time. What you need to do is learn the word of God. And then you'll be so much better off at arguing the existence of God for the two people you're going to run into in life that don't believe in God. Now, is William Lane Craig a right divider? No, absolutely not. <laughs> he is not. Nobody at Houston Christian University is. Toby in Oklahoma. Can I, can I come back to you in just a second, Toby? There's, there's some discussion about knee here. Watch my knee again. Watchman is garbage. I knew a gal who got hooked on his books and read every one of them several years later. She didn't want anything to do with anything biblical. He's mystical Chinese. There's the possibility that even with his roots in Plymouth Brethren, Oh, Kelly, who knows something about apologetics is, is okay, not, not a bad statement. <laughs> Knowing the apologetic arguments is super helpful so we can get past them, dismiss them, and get to the scriptures. <laughs> I might argue the other, other way, start with the scriptures and, and the apologetic ar arguments will come. You know what would be fun sometime? I don't, I don't know, I, because I, I, I really don't spend time in that, those kind of philosophical discussions. But it might be fun sometime to get a, an apologist and just a solid Bible teacher who's not trained in, doesn't know any of the, doesn't even know what the word cosmology means. And to, to have them both give a presentation for the existence of God and see which one, obviously this is a little beauties in the eye of the beholder, but which one of those comes out as, uh, yeah, that's, that's it right there. Um, Kelly says, I'm giving a talk at my seminary's annual conference next week on the true legacy of Roe v. Wade. My entry point is law. My apologetic is reverse engineering a modern moment back to the beginning. That would, that would be interesting. That kind of apologetic, you know, sort of tracing, tracing a thought. Giving a defense, and I, we talk all the time about robust arguments here. In a sense, you know, what's a robust argument for the, for the existence of God? It's okay. I just think these apologetics, they sort of get in this little whirlwind over here of, of a few people that sit off on the side and talk philosophy. Back to Toby in Oklahoma. Hello, Pastor. Here is a question about the long hair discussion earlier that was yesterday. What are your thoughts on the Shroud of Turin? The image seems to show a man with long hair crucified. Do you think it's real? 
I viewed some videos claiming that it was made by radiation light. Many believe that it uh, came from the, uh, the resurrection. Now, uh, of course, uh, almost all of you uh, remember the Shroud of Turin. The reason that this comes up in the long hair discussion is because uh, the, the image there appears to have long hair. I do not believe it is legitimate. Uh, it was, uh, yes, th that's what I thought we would find. The, I think of fairly recently, I, I don't know how long it's been actually, but they did some radiocarbon dating and as it says here, uh, showed it to be a medieval artifact. Uh, dates to 1354. We could we could read and see about all of that, but this is um, this is an example when you've got something that really would be that monumental to discover. Did we discover the face of Jesus? I think that would be kind of monumental. Take a piece of it, do the scientific analysis. Pretty easy, pretty simple. So why isn't that done with Codex Sinaiticus? If you can do it with the Shroud of Turin, for heaven's sake. the cloth that might have wrapped Jesus, then you can do it with the Codex Sinaiticus, some copy of the scripture, even if it's from the fourth century, and just prove it. But I do not think the uh, Shroud of uh, Turin is, uh, is legitimate. I think that you could recreate... the Shroud of Turin using Dark Ages technology, you could make another one. It's a fake. Was it faked to look like this or was it like, you know, every now and then you see, uh, you know, some lady in Mexico picks up her tortilla and it's got the faith of Jesus in it and everybody. It was just an accidental thing. Which one was it? I don't really know. Uh, but it goes, uh, goes back there. You know, um, th th here's kind of interesting. This, this argument does go back a long way. Here's John Calvin, not my friend, but uh, 1543 he explained reasons why the shroud cannot be genuine in 1543. And still people are talking about, you know, whether it can be genuine. And I don't know if he has a robust argument there, but uh, nonetheless, that's on the, uh, on the page, uh, the, the same Wikipedia page about the Shroud of Turin. So I do not think that this, the Shroud of Turin is real. Therefore, I don't think we have any evidence of Jesus's long hair. That's how that all came, came about uh, right there. Um, wow. So many questions. <laughs> Let's take this one that's fresh from last night. So by next week, it's not old. Larry, our friend in Grand Blanc, the town that was named after me in Michigan, in your teaching last night on Romans 14, 17, you had the color code for verse 17 green. It sure seems to me it should be black because the subject is the kingdom. Please explain why it would be for the body of Christ also. Okay, let, let's, let's do look at that. And, uh, you know, I have, uh, I, I changed one of them. I think I changed verse 14 from black to blue. Uh, and some of these I have struggled with. It's, it's, it's not an easy job necessarily doing it. But let's look at uh, this one. Yeah, okay. So the, the kingdom of God, this is the passage that, uh, that uh, 
Austin brought up yesterday and that we uh, discussed then at more in depth last night. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Why did I make that green? I, I, I get your point very much that that seems like it should be black because the subject is the kingdom and the kingdom is not about us. And, and, and probably I could go either way with it. I would, uh, I need to, I need to refine. If I refined blue, well, if I refine blue as the basis for the doctrine of Christian living, this should be black. In a sense, I've defined blue here as what is true for the body of Christ. Well, it's true that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But there is no kingdom of God for us today. So that truth, I'll st- overstate it a little bit here, that truth almost doesn't matter. It's like saying green-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eaters. Are hungry. Okay, but we don't have any in our town. So it doesn't matter. So there's a, there's a pretty decent argument there to make it black because really you... we. It's, it's only incidental, and that's where I went with green. But it's a very arguable point there. I'm, I'm glad you caught that, because that, uh, that is good. Uh, some of these other questions I am going to save for tomorrow, or Monday, excuse me, because, my friend, it is Friday! Time for Psycho Babble with Dr. White. The time of the program with Dr. White comes and gives Psycho Babble. Analyzing your problems, the doctor is in, the psychiatrist is available for absolutely free for these few moments a week only. This can set you free from all the psychological burdens upon you. We have a few psychobabble questions that come in. Let's uh, see what we've got today. I have a friend who watches a Christian blogger, and he opens each session (laughs) with mannequins in bikinis. (laughs) She requested that he, I guess the friend's a she here. So the, the friend requested that the blogger change that part of the opening and expressed why it was offensive to her. In so many words, he told her that it was her problem and she was free to have it. (laughs) After all, it's only mannequins. The body is a beautiful thing. While listening to your Roman series, this situation popped in my mind. Does verse 14 apply to this. I think that's verse 14 from, from uh, last night. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the which, uh, which says, let me uh, pop that up here. Uh, verse 14, which says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in of itself, but to him who esteemeth anything to be unclean, it is unclean. Okay. In a, in a sense, yes, that does, that, that does fit there. There is nothing uh, necessarily um, in its simplest sense, there is nothing necessarily immoral about a mannequin in a bikini. However, not only, so in that sense, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, it's how you esteem it. But the very next verse If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Maybe also speaks to this. So the body is a beautiful thing. I suspect that a mannequin is actually 
more well refined than perhaps a great percentage of women in the world. And so they're probably beautiful things, artistically. <laughs> The person says, I know this is the overlap period, but I also struggle with the opening. Do both of us need some further psychoanalysis? I would just say we, we live, we, we cannot just say that a mannequin in a bikini is just a beautiful thing. It really is a sexual thing because the beauty is, is in the sexuality of it. And is the opening session of a Christian, I don't know what he's talking about, obviously. Uh, I mean, I think it would be kind of weird if I had a couple bikini clad mannequins here. There would, there would really have to be some kind of a, connection or a purpose for that? It's hard for me to imagine on a regular basis what that is. You know, on this, I would say, and I don't have any idea who the blogger is or whatnot. I have not watched bloggers with uh, bikini-clad mannequins on them. But, uh, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would say he, he, the Christian blogger has an, has an odd He's not going to go to hell for, for it. But is, is it just for clickbait? Get people to watch? I mean, that's, that's gone on forever. You, you go, go, go to, I don't know, uh, Let's, let's put 1940s cigarette ads. How's that? Um, and if we look at the 1940s cigarette ads, uh, there you go. I mean, there's a few, few men in there, but look at almost all of them are, are, are pretty women. And, and I suspect if we thumb down through there, we would find uh, a bikini-clad one, even in the 40s. Uh, here's, uh, what's this one right there? There we go. Old Gold. Uh, there it is. Uh, old Gold Cigarettes. That one, zip top, opens, double, quick. Flavor-rich blend. Now, what's the old... Sailor? Is that what you would call her? I don't know. Um, it's, it's clickbait. So, it's, it's, I, I, I think you've got an ethical issue on should that be done. If there was some connection somehow to the content of that day, I suspect even, you all, you know I've kind of got a sense of humor and I push the edge a little bit. Uh, if, if, if there was some reason I thought we needed bikini-clad mannequins to, uh, to introduce the show, yeah, you wouldn't be that offended by it. But if I did that every day, you would say, what is up with him? Something's up. So, no, I don't think you need further psychoanalysis. I think... Um, that either he's trying to clickbait or he likes bikini clad mannequins or something's going on there that uh, I probably would not recommend. What did, does he wear a tie or seem like a bathing suit or something? I'm not sure. Interesting. <laughs> I have a friend moving on who's always bragging about how much money, uh, how much money he makes. But when it comes to going out, bowling, dinner, so on. He always complains about having money problems. If he makes so much money, why can't he just spend a few bucks to be with his friends? What are your thoughts? There are some people who make or have a lot of money 
but they won't spend, you know, a, 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 a dime on it. I mean, I think we call them tightwads back in the back in the forties. Uh, to those people, I would say that there there is more to life than having money in the bank. Get out there, enjoy your family, and buy their dinner. You, you need to learn some generosity here. Uh, in, enjoy money. No, no, no problem with that. Enjoy, enjoy some of the money. You make, you make a lot of money, that's good. Now, making a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean anything because you can also have a lot of bills. There are, especially if you're young, you can make a lot of money and not have any money. Uh, but if you make a lot of money and you've got some money, or if you make a lot of money and don't have any money, maybe try to, uh, uh, you know, shift some things, do some things a little differently so that you uh, can. I, I really think that, I don't think people uh, want to be irresponsible, but, uh, you know, heavens, get out there and enjoy it a little bit and, uh, and, and, and spend two dollars on it and what I used to I used to struggle with this on myself because I think everybody has had money problems you know and and uh, I would go and I'm thinking the tip you know well it comes to uh four dollars and uh 49 cents and 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 there was there was always this side of me that said put the whole five dollar bill down there that waitress probably needs the 51 cents worse than I do. Be generous. Be happy about it. You can, obviously, you can go too far either way here. But, but here's, here's what I think even more. For, you, for, for this friend who makes a lot of money but can't just go spend a few bucks and enjoy it with his friends. Um, well, there, uh, maybe he doesn't want, maybe they're not his friends. Maybe he doesn't want to spend time with his friends, in which case he should just say, nah, can't tonight. But here's the thing. I think that people shouldn't really know how much money he makes or whether he has money problems. Very few people around should know that. You, there's things obviously you can pick up and you can discern, but you can fake that pretty well as also, you know, I've got all these lovely ties. I don't know if I spent $2 on them. <laughs> you know, I hate, hate to reveal the truth here. I'm selling it for eight bucks. And, uh, but it's the storage cost, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so you can, you can, you can fake that a little bit, but some of it's just obvious. Okay, he's got some money issues or he's got lots of money, whatever. But why is your friend bragging about how much money he makes? That's, that's, I don't even want to know that. It's not my business. It's his business. I hope he makes a bunch, you know. I hope he spends it. I hope he saves it, whatever. But if, if, uh, if anyone is out there who has a, who, who, who has such a low esteem that you have to build your, your own goodness based upon uh, bragging how much money you make. You know, I, I make $7 an hour. I, well, nobody, nobody cares, honestly. And if you're bragging about how much money you make, we're, 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 you, honestly, we're probably tired of being around you. And uh, we're certainly tired of paying for your lunch. So just get over it and keep your money to yourself. Be quiet about your money. If you can't go because you're saving for something, just say, hey, that sounds fun, but you know, I'm saving up to get me a new tractor. And so I'm not going to go out today, but you all have fun. Be, be, uh, be, be, be personal and quiet about your money. Last one for the day. <laughs> I got more psychobabble coming out here. Someone says, my hunch is he's blowing smoke, doesn't have a lot of money, and maybe it's his wife that controls him. <laughs> that could be. It's, it's a possibility. I have a friend who is, uh, for the most part, a very happy person, but every once in a while, they get in their mood of being very depressed and sad and they don't want to do anything and they won't say much. Nothing's changed in their life. They don't give a reason why they're upset. What are your thoughts? I would say uh, uh, partly it depends on how long this is. If, if uh, they're depressed and sad for the morning, they probably miss their coffee. 
uh, if they're depressed and sad for two or three days, and this is a regular pattern, just recognize it and, 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 uh, and don't worry about it. You know, sometimes people need to have their depression period, uh, you know, every six weeks they need to, they, they, they get depressed and, and it's this cycle and we understand the cycle. And if they understand the cycle, say, Hey, uh, you know, why don't you, um, go spend some time by yourself. <laughs> uh, so some people are just in a secular, circular, secular, secular. I'll go back to where I started. Depression. If it's a secular depression, it's in a cycle is what I'm trying to say. Then that's probably more of a habit than anything. It could be a dietary matter. Now, if they are depressed and sad and don't want to do anything and that's unusual, that's long-term. And, and by that, I mean more than more than three or four days, more than a week. So you got a coworker maybe who's, you know, normally happy, happy, happy. And yet now they come in, uh, fine. Uh, they're just kind of quiet. Don't, especially if it's a man, don't even try to figure it out. No, it's, and especially if you're a woman, don't try to figure it out. What's wrong? Nothing. Something's wrong. Nothing. What's wrong? Oh, I know it's wrong. That somebody trying, for me, I can tell you, somebody trying to pry into what's in the deepest, darkest corners of your heart. I ain't going to tell you if I even knew. And 99.9% of the time, I don't even know. I just know I want to be grumpy today or sad today or depressed today or quiet today. I want you out of here. So let them, it's my party, I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> let them cry. Let them, let them have their, their time. Now, if that goes on and you can see, okay, this is becoming a problem. If you can discern what that, that there's actually some, some trigger for this, like a, like a physical thing in life, then try to say, hey, here's a way out of this. But if there's, if there's nothing and they, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to quit their job. They don't want to move to Tuscaloosa. They don't want to, uh, you, you know, what there's, there's, there's not any physical issues that you can take care of then. And, and it goes on, then maybe you could, uh, maybe you could suggest that they, they check their diet and exercise. Are they, are they, are they healthy? I would say don't, unless it's super bad, don't send them to a doctor. Doctor's going to give them some stupid medicine that's going to fake the whole thing. What they need is some more vitamin C. They need some real vitamin D. I am not a, I am not a fan of vitamin D pills, capsules. I don't think they do any good. I think that uh, the the connection people have made between good health and vitamin D is is totally incidental, and taking the vitamin D is not the same as going out and getting the sunshine. I think that the sunshine does give you vitamin D, but it's not vitamin D that's fixing you. It's something else, and they they've associated it with vitamin D because that's 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 it. So. So I would, you know, sunshine's my, my, my answer for everything. You got to get out there and get some sun. If you're pasty white, well, not only are you going to be depressed, but you're depressing the rest of us as well. <laughs> get out there and get some sun. Um, if that goes on for a long time, get them out. They've got to get some fresh air. They've got to get some sunshine and they've got to eat some good stuff, especially a lot of protein. And they got to quit eating all this stuff that's uh, going to weigh them down. I am not the best eater. I don't, I, I had Fig Newtons for breakfast this morning. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I don't do that every day, but I'm good with a Fig Newton every now and then. And, um, uh, and, and yet you get, you get too much of uh, manufactured food. It'll, it'll put you into a depression, sometimes into an anger. So if everything they're eating is coming from a package, that's their problem. And some people are going to be more sensitive to this. 
So if, if you can look at it and say, ah, you know what? Yesterday we ate at fast food and then, then he had a TV dinner at night. And for breakfast, he got one of those hostess donuts that was, uh, you know, cupcakes that was in a, in a sealed package. That's what he ate yesterday and today's, maybe you can make that link there because that, that would do it for any of you. If, if those of you who are eating all processed foods, you're probably depressed and sad sometimes. Um, so, and, and here's the good news. You don't have to say, I'm not going to eat cupcakes. You just say, I'm going to eat homemade cupcakes. Problem solved. Oh, John, I like you. He says, I had an ice cream sandwich for breakfast. <laughs> I, I got away. I got in, into a little bit of diet, because, but I do think depression and sadness does somewhat go in diet, but somewhat it's personality too. Some people are trained to be depressed the, the Eeyore, remember, and Christopher Robin's friend, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, that was just his his personality. Here, maybe it's this person's personality to be a very happy person, but every now and then they need this little depression thing to uh, refuel. Ah, let him have it if that's the case. It's fine to to be uh, to be like that. Uh, but if, if this is becoming a problem, then I would check what they're eating more than anything. Or if there's some, some reality, then take care of the reality. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an extended session of Psycho Babble with Dr. White. I hope you have enjoyed the Psycho Babble, and uh, I uh, look forward to seeing you on uh, Sunday, 9:45. We've got Samson and Delilah. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll get mannequins, bikini-clad mannequins, to be like Delilah. Have them up there. Uh, I, I would only need one, I guess. Uh, so I, does anybody, I don't have a mannequin on hand. If anyone's coming to Taos and happens to have a mannequin, um, uh, we could, uh, we could have that. <laughs> um, I don't have a bikini either. So if I had the mannequin, I would need to borrow the bikini, bikini to, to, to clad the mannequin. But we've got Samson and Delilah Sunday morning at 9.45. We've got King David, first of the series of King David, starting Sunday at 10.45. I got lots of questions that I did not get to today. My apologies. I will be back next week, and I will look forward to uh, seeing you. And it is a blessing to have each one of you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. See you Sunday. See you